forgive me, but why would you come here to see me if you disagree so passionately with my views? To make you realize that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Good. Anthony Hopkins, that's my name. I'm playing Sigmund Freud. My name is Matthew Good. I am playing Clive Stapleton Lewis. C.S. Lewis, yes. Freud was a Jewish atheist, and C.S. Lewis is a Christian. And they have this friendly and respectful debate between them. And it's interesting because I played C.S. Lewis in a film called Shadowlands. So here I'm playing opposite this brilliant actor, Matthew Good, who's playing C.S. Lewis. The, the famous uh, Christian apologist slash he was about to become, or he becomes after this film, a uh, very famous novelist. I mean, this whole thing is a dream play to me because Freud, I apparently never met C.S. Lewis and I, they knew of each other, but I'm sure that uh, C.S. Lewis probably knew of Freud. Everyone knew of Freud. He is the person we all go back to to talk about psychology about as the beginning. It doesn't mean that today we haven't come a long way from him. He's had so much influence. He's still such a part of of how we think about things, the ego, the id, the superego. It's, it's, it's still all the, the basis of what everything has gone on to do in terms of psychology, as started with Freud. He had enormous influence. Good. Hey, Mark. Armand Nicolai, I, who was the one who wrote the book, um, The Question of God. And then Mark St. Germain um, is a playwright, and he took the uh, book and ran with it into a beautiful play. He, he was looking at Freud as a way to look at atheism, and then he did a counterbalance to that, and he brought in C.S. Lewis um, to, to give the other side of things in Christianity. Um, but that these two titans would actually decide to come together, I mean, obviously this is fictional and it's a dream, but, but the notion of having two people willingly go into such a heated topic of God um, and want to do that, to me, was incredibly intriguing and timely. And if people could only actually have conversations and learn about tolerance and respect for one another, I mean, that's what really drew me to the project. Mark obviously thought, what a brilliant conceit to have those two minds meet, and then also have the danger um, of it being the beginning, well, the, A, the end of Freud's life, he was going to die within 10 days, and the beginning of World War II, we're on the cusp of that happening that day. So it's, I mean, so there's an awful lot going on. I embraced the dream element of this film. We wanted to stay as close as we could um, to the truth of who these people were, I think. We weren't trying to take great liberties that way. You know, you never get to be in a room with the great minds, like the Hawking or whoever. They're, you know, you don't get to see those sorts of debates. So they, the author brought this together, they are two dream it's a dream play in a way. I mean, what Anthony brings to the table is pretty spectacular, I think. Matthew is a great listener. I mean, and that's like one of the hardest things to do is to really, truly listen and be present. And every single second he's present and, and working really, really hard. He's just so easy, gentle to work with. Very smart, but um, obtrusive, gentle, kind. Which is all you need. So Matthew, I spoke to when the when the initial offer came through, and I was like, oh God, he's really intelligent. This is so nice, but in a way that's not you know intimidating. And so we had ample time to talk it out, and, blah, 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 and just like, you know, he's very happy to say, sometimes I'm not sure. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. And that's great because like there's there are gray areas. Not everything is black and white. There's the Freud that was on the page, and then there was the Freud that. Anthony Hopkins brought to the table. I love to work and I love a challenge. So I read as much as I could on Freud himself before I started on this. I'm not well versed in psychoanalysis, but I'm fascinated by it. What surprised me was seeing Freud come to life with Anthony in a way that was just so full of humanity and somebody that is looking at mortality head on. He was somebody that was intellectually incredibly curious. I'm fascinated by that side of existence. What are we? And Freud was interested in the same thing as was C.S. Lewis, any religious believer or devout atheist, whichever it is. And um, I don't know whose side I'm on. Um, that was something that um, Anthony Hopkins and I talked about a lot, was about how Freud has come to the end and that 
in that you, you do take a last look at, at the possibilities of things. So it would be nice if he was wrong and that there could be a heaven, <laughs> but I think he's very skeptical of it. Uh, action! Come on. Don't go up. Well, I'm not leaving you. The idea behind this film is that Freud invites C.S. Lewis to his house because C.S. Lewis um, was a devout atheist who embraced his brand of atheism, Freud's brand of atheism, and um, when he was influenced by the Inklings and embraced Christianity, um, that was seen as a betrayal by Freud. So Freud invites him to the house to explain to him why he would embrace such a lie. And Freud loses patience with C.S. Lewis halfway through. He says, how can you how can we forgive Hitler? You think we're all gonna go and, you know, appease? This man is a monster. And he says at one point, he says, of course you're shocked because, you know, you believe that we must forgive and let's turn the other cheek, as Neville Chamberlain said, how can we? And of course, history proved later, 40 to 50 million people was butchered in that last war. The thing with Anthony Hopkins that he's, he's an icon, he's, uh, he's just, there's no words to really explain how great he is. He matches that in terms of his generosity and his creativity and his willingness to and desire to collaborate. I mean, it's unparalleled. Being so prepared as he was allowed him that freedom to, to do what he did. He's doing it with a tremendous amount of confidence from, from all the hard work that he's put into it. I mean, he, he created that voice, that grovelly voice over, um, that, was, that was a lot of work for him. That wasn't easy, I don't think. And there's a scene in this where I, um, we have this debate, I said to C.S. Lewis, I said, so you're interested in, you've studied symbolism and fantasy. So it's because I've, my whole life I've studied fantasy. And he's surrounded by gods in his office. Why was he surrounded by gods if he's an atheist? He said, all my life I've been fascinated by worship, fascinated by religion. Why would an atheist collect gods from all over the world? Effigies of God. There must be something up there that's peculiarly puzzling to him. What is this all about? So that's the way I approach Freud. That he's not adamant about it, but he thinks, well, who knows? And at the end of his life, none of us know. You know, that was one of the things that surprised me the most in, in talking to people about Freud was that he was somebody that was constantly challenging his own ideas. He was somebody that um, had a great sense of humor. He wasn't afraid to be wrong. It makes sense for this fictionalized version of things for him to be right at the end and thinking, all right, let me take another look at that. And that's what he does with using Lewis as a, as a tool for that. His theories were ever changing. He was able to look at his theories and change them and whatever. And so even at the end of his life, he's going, have I missed something about Christianity? I don't think I have. Well, he wasn't just talking about God. He was, you know, he, he, had, he had a plethora of theories. And, you know, he was talking to real people all the time on his couch about dreams and fantasies and all sorts of things. And he compiled extremely good, it was, it was almost mathematical reasoning as to this is, he made an awful lot of sense. It was something that with all the conservative sort of Dons like Lewis were rebelling against. They thought it was new, sort of radical thought. They thought it was, they thought it was as, as much humbo jumbo as, as as Christianity was to him. So it was it was the, it was a clash of those sort of two schools. The time on set was really really special. I'll never forget it um, at Ardmore. That time was amazing. Tony had shot a Lion in Winter 50 years prior, um, and there was a lot of talk about where we were going to shoot this film, and I. I knew how important it was for him to come back and that he really, really wanted to go to Ardmore. And Ardmore really worked hard to make it work for us. It was incredible to be there on that first day when, when he walked in and on the same stage that he was 50 years earlier. And just, it was a little moment that was very special to be part of. It's been a total delight. I don't think many actors get the opportunity to to a work on something that's that's like this, like this interesting, but also I get to I get to certainly as I have done for the last two weeks solid, just be in a room with with the great man with with Anthony. We had the most amazing crew. My heads of department were outstanding. I had Luciana Rigi, who I'd worked with before, who was our production designer, and she. She helped not only recreate this over in Ireland at Artmore Studio, but also um, she helped 
build the canvas that we break out of these rooms too as well. It's like a character unto itself. We're sitting here in uh, Freud's house in London in Hempstead um, and this is the actual, this is the actual house um, and at one point we even thought maybe we get to shoot in here but that didn't happen so Luciana she she came in a few a number of visits here and had incredible help from the museum as well um, in helping us recreate this. I'm looking at it, it's, it's unbelievable, the recreation that was done. Ben Smithard shot the film, um, absolutely genius. I don't know how we did it in the days we did it in. I think it looks absolutely beautiful. No, it's all the creatives on this film were, were just outstanding. I mean, it was, I, I was very, very blessed. Uh, my editor, Paul Tothill, amazing. My brother, Kobe Brown, did the score, absolutely beautiful. Um, what Emer was able to create with Anna and those costumes, I think they just really set um, a kind of a modern tone. The last thing I wanted to do was make just the men in tweed kind of um, period piece, and I felt like Emer really helped me out a lot with the costumes. Yeah, very blessed with all the creatives on the film. And the actors on this film, I, I'm just in awe of. My contribution in terms of writing probably was more towards Anna and Dorothy and building out that relationship. Anna Freud, they had a complex relationship and wanting women to have a, a bigger voice in this film so it wasn't just two, two men talking the whole time. Because I think the women paid such pivotal roles in their lives. I mean, Anna was an incredible woman. Uh, and what she did with her life as, a, as an analyst, but like for children, and she was working with children um, from war-torn countries, and her and, and Dorothy, they were groundbreakers. She was a very strong character and such an enormous part of Freud's end of his life, um, his daughter was, and so important to her that you couldn't make this film and just have her be not present. Live Lisa Fries, I, I'd seen a Babylon Berlin and was obsessed and knew early on that was somebody that I really, really, really wanted to play the role. It was funny, because Liv was like, how did you know? And I, I was just like, I just knew. I, I knew she was right for it, and I'm so thrilled that she was willing to go on the journey. I felt very strongly that I didn't want to have just two people in an office. It was imperative to humanize these characters. <laughs> um, what he's done so brilliantly is take these two figures that we, the, and it often happens with very famous people, and you know, you think you know them, you know their work, you know what they stand for, you know some of their theories and everything else, but you don't know their, the inner workings, what makes them, their, their humanity, their sort of figureheads of, of these branches of theology and, and science, but they're very complicated humans. And, and what Mark's language does, and by placing them in the room together, you get to see all of the layers, all of the strata of the damage and and, and also the lightness. So there's, there's a lot of humor in this as well. This is a film about tolerance in a lot of ways, but it's also a film about tolerance for people that don't agree with you. Certainty is the killer, and um, Hitler was certain. Stalin was certain. The great dictators were certain. That's the killer that destroys life. Being uncertain, being compromising instead of arguing and fighting. The world we're living today, nobody compromises anymore. And that's the deadly part of our present society. Certainty. I know the truth. I know. This is my truth. It's okay for people to disagree. Uh, you don't have to have the same beliefs. And that was a, it was very important to me to be able to tell the story where people don't agree and yet can do it respectfully. And if we could all do that a little bit more, I think that I, I, I'm sort of, if I have a message in this film is that I don't have a message, <laughs> you know? Like, let live and let live. So you bury your doubts, you bury your memories of the war, but at the core of your being, we're all cowards before death.